So I woke up this morning and saw that the Primogen watched my video. It was really, really cool to see. Thank you Prime for taking the time to watch it and thank you to whoever submitted it to him. Uh, that really made my day. And thanks to everyone who came in yesterday and showed comments and support and everything like that. Seeing someone watch the video made me realize a lot of things that I glossed over. Mostly made me realize that a lot of people are sleeping on Kotlin. And Kotlin's really awesome. So I just wanted to take a bit of time to go through some Kotlin features just to show off what it can do. None of these features are particularly unique to Kotlin, but to have them all in one language is quite rare. I've only found a couple examples of languages that can do all these and they have some other flaws like being dynamically typed. So the first feature is named and default arguments. For example, this function called save user details takes a first name, middle name, last name, date of birth, and last login date. As you can see, the middle name is a nullable field and it defaults to null. And last login date defaults to instant.now. There's two features here. One is that I can call the function and pass the named attributes like this. And the second one is that I can choose to leave out the ones that have default values. So I don't even have to provide a middle name or last login date. I can if I want, but I don't have to. And this is useful because sometimes even with static typing, you can mess things up. I remember this bug that I couldn't figure out how to fix. Uh, and it was in Java before we migrated to Kotlin. And we had a reader host and a writer host that was being passed to a function and then passed to the next function. And in one of the calls, the reader host and the writer host were swapped. But because you weren't using these arguments, it was just so easy to miss. This is a very cool feature that I often miss when I go to other languages. The second feature is the trailing lambda, which is one that we covered yesterday, but I just wanted to show it here, maybe explain it a little better. The lambda function, as you will all probably know, is a function that you pass to another function, and then you can execute that function and then do some logic on it. So in this example, I have an original string, and then I pass a function that manipulates the string, and then I print the result. And in Kotlin, when you do this, the general syntax is to just put the lambda after to make it trail. And this function is this lambda function here. So this is a function that takes an input string and manipulates it. So this first example, I take this and I call the variable input, there's this one here, and then I return that. That's how I manipulate it, that's a manipulating function, and the result will print that out. But with lambda functions in Kotlin, you can omit the variable name if it's just one variable and you can just use it. So the shorthand for this, if I wanna make a new, another function, this one just reverses the string. It takes the original string, the lambda function reverses it by using it and then prints it out. And the default Kotlin library ships with a bunch of cool trailing lambda functions and they're all quite functional, which is amazing. Uh, for example, I have this list, uh, this is an immutable list and I call this mapping function and then map all these numbers to floats. And then here I have a filter, so here you can see the it's cut off a little bit. This one's a bit more visible. So I have a list, same six numbers, and then I call a filter function and I filter for a filter, so this thing takes a predicate where the T is whatever's in your list and it returns a Boolean. So my Boolean is it is smaller than four. So it returns all the numbers in the list smaller than four. You can also do some more complicated things. So for example, I do the sum of each number plus one. So it's doing two plus three plus four plus five plus six plus seven. I'm not gonna go in depth into this, but the kind of everything tool for these kinds of functions is called a fold. Uh, and when you do a fold, you pass it an initial value. And then what you get back is the initial value and the value in the list. And you can do manipulation. Uh, I'm doing an index right now. And what I'm doing is I'm setting, I'm passing it an initial value of a map. And then I go through and then whatever the value is, I set the map value to that index. Sorry, it's a bit complicated, but it's just to kind of show you what you can look forward to. And obviously you can write your own ones. And the next thing I want to talk about, next feature is sealed hierarchies. This is for all the Rust people out there. So here I have a sealed interface and I'll explain why it's called sealed soon, but it might be obvious, which is identification. And the identification can either be none, a driver's license, which has a license number and expiry date, or a passport, which has a country and a passport number. And sealed interface means that the compiler will guarantee 
that whatever is defined here are the only instances of this interface in your entire code base. And then what you can do, just like in Rust, is you can have a when statement. When identification is a driver's license, I can access for values from the driver's license. When it's none, then I don't get anything. And when it's passport, I get the passport number. And What's nice, if you're not familiar with these, so if I add something new to this identification, I will get a compiler error. So everywhere where I have a when statement, unless I have an else, which you probably shouldn't, whenever you add something here, you'll be forced to handle it in all the cases, which means you're forced to handle all the invalid state. And this does mean that you can also create your own result typing colon, and that's pretty easy to do if you'd prefer to do that. And next feature is null safety. So Kotlin has really good null safety. Uh, so this is just some helper function for my example, which uh, I'll use in a little bit. So this function, get username, takes an ID and returns a nullable string. So it'll either return the username if ID is valid or it'll return null if it's not. And in this case, it just always returns null. So I do get username with an ID of one. So this user will either be a string or null. And this is how you do null safety. It's kind of similar to TypeScript, but you get uh, some niceties with it. So with just for value, you can do question mark dot and then a function on it. And then here, this is called the Elvis operator. If it is null, it'll do whatever is the other side of the Elvis operator. So you could throw here or you could return to the parenting function. You could return an error. You could throw an exception. You can also add a default value. And this is what I do here. So the Elvis operator is there. And then I return a default value of none. You probably shouldn't be doing this. You should be returning errors instead of default values. But if you want to, you can. Let statements, which we have an example here, is another thing that makes nulls very fun to handle in Kotlin, where if I have a null, I can use let and then I can have a lambda function here. So let is just um, a function that has a trailing lambda that will return the non-null value of that. So here it is not nullable anymore. Just to make this clear, user in here is null. And then once I'm in here, the user is no longer null. So I can hover it and there's no question mark. So this is not a null and I can do whatever I want. And if this isn't null, it'll execute all this and return it here. But if it is null, it'll pass here and do whatever I do here, whether that's returning an error, throwing an exception, or adding a default value. Fifth feature is that everything's immutable by default. If you do val, which you almost always should, it's not immutable, so this doesn't work. I can't update the name. Same thing with lists. By default, list is immutable, but I can create a mutable list. I can add numbers to the mutable list, but I can't add numbers to the immutable list. So the next feature is coroutines, kind of like go routines, which everyone raves about. This just lets you do concurrency in a simplified way. Uh, so this run blocking just makes it so that everything runs without delay within this block. So as far as this block is concerned, say like I do a print here, it'll wait until this whole block before printing the other one. And then inside here I can launch. And this is basically like doing Go in Golang. Next feature is extension functions. And we talked a little bit about these, but I just want to show them a little more. So I have a data class here, just like the function at the top. Data classes can also have default values. They can also have named arguments when you're creating them. And I've created a few extension functions and just to show the different kind of things you can do. When you're starting out, you'll be writing a lot of this, uh, doing this. And when you do an extension function on a class, this just gets you the actual class. This extension function is called get full name and it returns a string. And here I do this dot first name, this dot middle name, this dot last name, and return a big string. But you can actually omit the this. So I've made another one called get names. If you just start typing in here, you can access things that are directly on the class without having to write this. And then finally, in Kotlin, if your function is a single expression, you can just make it an equal sign. So get middle and last name. Uh, and you can remove the squiggly braces and just simplify the syntax a little bit. You can actually omit this as well. It'll just infer. Finally, the last point is that you can define extension functions on classes that are defined in other files. Uh, and this is useful for separating data and logic. Uh, and for example, this is an extension function that I'm running on string that checks if all the characters, it'll loop through all. So this is one of the Lambda functions from before. This will return true if all members match the Boolean in the middle. So I'm checking if each thing is uppercase. And I just realized this is wrong, this should be is uppercase. 
eighth feature is that you actually still get all the Java ecosystem, for better or worse. You should probably try and minimize it since you lose a lot of the null safety and you might get random exceptions thrown in your face when you use Java. But you get the whole Java ecosystem. If I can use the Discord for J client without needing to do anything weird. But the advantage is that it's not Java. I don't have to write new. I don't have to do all the boilerplate. It's much simpler. Like I just wrote this example since I'm defining a class here and I'm defining an attribute, a public attribute. I don't have to write setters or getters. I don't have to write a constructor. I can just create this data class like this and then I can access this like that. And when you interrupt with Java, it'll automatically generate all the setters and getters. And same the other way, when you're using Java classes, you won't have to use the setters and getters. You can just access the fields directly. And one more thing I wanted to mention for all the people that have been scared of Kotlin because of Java, that you don't have to use Maven. Um, Gradle is easier. It's not the best build system out there, but it's very extensible and it's much more readable than Maven. Finally, I have a couple extra features. One is that you can write functions functions with spaces in it. And this kind of seems silly, but it's super useful when you have long function names, especially in unit tests. This is how we write our unit tests. We do given a scenario, when this and that. I only wish that I could put these on multiple lines, you can't, but it's still better than having to write everything camel cased and you just get lost and when reading it. Uh, another thing is uh, multi-line strings are really nice. It's pretty self-explanatory. The final thing I want to touch on, which I've mentioned a little bit, that everything is an expression in Kotlin. You can do ternary statements just by doing if else, and this score will be a number here. It's a little weird to get used to, but once you wrap your head around the fact that everything is an expression, it makes your code so much more ergonomic and so much easier to read. There are some things I dislike about Kotlin. Uh, the main one is that it's backed by IntelliJ. So I have to use this ID so I can't use NeoVim. I, you're pretty much locked into this ID, which is a shame. Um, the other downside you should know about Colin is that it's garbage collected. Performance in my testing tends to be similar to Go, but it's not going to be Rust. It's not going to be C++. It's not going to be C. Uh, you should just know that. Like, it's garbage collected. You don't have memory management. That's not an option. But I think a lot of people in general are sleeping on Colin. It's a super powerful language. As much as I don't like being forced into the IDE, I come back to it because it's so ergonomic. Yeah, I really enjoy it. Thank you.